All right. It's been a while since we've done a Helping the Helpers conference. I want to thank you for joining me. Um, this is Dr. Tom. and <clears throat> What I want to talk about in this lecture is the effect upon the developing mind and the conscience, the unconscious, and the no conscience. Now, what I'm talking about the effects upon the developing mind in the conscience, the no conscience, part of the brain, and the way that it will fold and make an identity. So it's going to be in the areas of deprivation, hyperstimulation, and um, what they do, because they'll do different things. Now, let's begin with hyperstimulation. And there have been there was a tremendous amount of research done in what happens to the mind with hyperstimulation. Now let's just get into the basics, and this is because some of this stuff will be redundant or common knowledge. Um, for instance, in illusion work or hypnotherapy or anything where you want to take and, and create an environment where a person becomes highly suggestible, you overstimulate them. The brain can only take three areas of focus. What I mean is, is focus or concentration that requires various parts of the brain. In other words, there has to be a cross networking and there has to be an assimilation of knowledge that one takes in all of the stimulus coming around you but then has a draw upon the empirical or what we'd call the base of knowledge that has been established. But it also has to put it into a context of how it's dealing with it today. How is it affecting me at the moment? How will this affect me in the future? But it's primarily concerned with the moment. So, for instance, if you want to deceive somebody or you want to put them in a suggestible state, you become what people call a fast talker. A fast talker, that's why they call them fast talking salesmen in the 70s. And this is when the research was just being um, put into the market. So they found if you talk fast, that'll bring in one point of hyperstimulation. If you talk about things the person hasn't thought about, in other words, you bring up price or design, but you add things they don't know about, then that, uh, that goes against the empirical knowledge base and begins to add to it. So you've stimulated the second point. And then the third point is how will it affect that person now more than so in the immediate future, which is why people will buy cars and make payments. I kid you not. I never would have thought possible, but there are people all over America that are paying $600 plus a month for a car payment. And 400 for insurance. They're paying over $1,000 just for a car. Friends, that's $12,000 a year. That's a tremendous amount of money for most people. Just to have a vehicle. I remember when you could buy a house for that. So what happens is when you stimulate somebody in three different ways, it will take and override the brain and cause it to become suggestible. The greater the amount of stimulation or the greater the variety, in other words, you can just have an abundance of stimulation on two points, but if you deprive one or accentuate one, it's either going to drive them away or drive them to, okay? It will create a, a position where you can control the way that person's thinking. Now, how does this affect the developing mind? Well, what they have found is in hyperstimulation, for extended periods of time, it will break the will. It will override the sensory ability for development. For instance, if you put somebody into a room that um, is like 10 foot by 10 foot, big enough for them to go around, but there's no door handles on it. You know, the only door handles from the outside and they can't hurt themselves. But if you put strobe lights in there, and by strobe lights, I don't just mean the repeating ones, but strobe lights that are mixed with mesmer wheels that will have one spinning and then it'll have things going in the opposite direction. And then you put loud, cacophonic music. 
and then you put that person in there. At first, you put them in restraint. The will will begin to break. Then you go in there and unrestrain them and turn them loose, and you leave them in there for like three days, and you have a, a barrage of lights. Okay, the strobe lights will go from uh, typically blue to red to yellow, or to blue to red to green. Flashes of white, flashes of yellow. And so what it does is it causes a hyperstimulation. And in a three-day period to two-week period, it'll break that person's will completely. Um, if you leave them in there too long, it'll permanently destroy parts of their ability to function in society. To, it'll take away their normalcy or their ability to respond. So that's hyperstimulation. How about deprivation? Um, deprivation studies were done, you know, at Harvard and other places, and they would give students um, free college. You know, in other words, you get your college tuition would be paid, your room and board would be paid, all your expenses at the college would be paid if you would put yourself into these experiments. And these experiments were titled under various names. I'm not going to say any because I don't want this video to get blocked, um, but I can tell you when and where and what the names of these, of uh, many of these uh, experiments were called. But say, for instance, you put somebody in an isolation tank. It has an absence of all light absence of all sound because sound and vibrations because they're floating in a, a visceral liquid um, they have the oxygen pumped and they will be for instance their hands will be taped so that they can feel nothing and everything will be taped now this is the worst this is far both are incredibly destructive to the psyche, but deprivation at its extent of the deprivation tank um, will cause a person to shut down and die in the final expense. The body is designed to take in trillions of points of stimulation. Right now, you're taking in trillions of points, all the data bits of just seeing, just for the eyes, now counting the ears, the temperature, the ambiance, and all of that that's coming in is going into the empirical database, stimulation, empirical database, and then how it affects you at the moment, most importantly, and then secondarily after the 24 hour period. The farther out that it affects you, the greater the ability to stimulate you less. Let me say that again. The greater the impact in the future, the less it will stimulate you. How it'll affect you now, now, is what the the mind will think. And this is why they some auto places, they will check your profile, and uh, and if it, the computer suggests that you leave them to wait, then they'll leave them to wait. Now here's the reason, because impulse buyers, and they have databases now, this is why they sold all your and they still sell all your information, is to track how you buy and shop in stores and every other place. And they'll determine whether you're an impulse buyer by the top product you buy. If you're an impulse buyer, they'll make you wait. Sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes an hour. They'll come back and say enough, just get that carrot out there. And they'll watch for signs to see when you're breaking. Because an impulse buyer, they don't like to wait. They don't like to wait for anything. And... Um, by making them wait, it makes them want to buy something just so they can get on to their next amount of stimulation. So deprivation can destroy a developing mind. And so, for instance, there's that personality block that's considered incurable, which is narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, psychopathologies and sociopathologies, or antisocial personality disorders, psychopaths and sociopaths. That block of those five are considered to be incurable. Well, they say they don't know how that or schizophrenia is created. Schizophrenia is created by the way a person is stimulated. And I believe it happens in vitro and before delivery. 
as well as after. Okay? Demonization or demonic affliction has a lot to do with schizophrenia. Injuries can cause schizophrenia because it misaligns uh, the vertebrae. You have, you know, your seven vertebrae and um, between the C4 and the C5 or even up to the C6, the axiom, if it gets misplaced, can cause the effulgence, you know, at the central fissure point to be off. And what it does, it causes the brain to not receive the proper stimulation. It misaligns it. So how does this affect the developing personality? Disassociate personalities can be created by neglect, by locking somebody in a closet, by putting them in a dark basement, by putting them in a cage, by just not being there and them not having anyone else to be there. Humans are not good on their own. They are not good on their own. And um, you'll find that one person that has to separate from society, and that's because he has an extreme antisocial personality disorder. And that type of person will always be out away. Now, when it's not coupled with a sociopathology or psychopathology, they're harmless. They just want to live in the woods and be on their own. Okay. They call that schizophrenia, but it's actually just an antisocial personality disorder. Now, if they have a paranoia because there's a fear or a xenophobia where they're a fear of different species or particular species or all species, um, then that is considered schizophrenia. But here's what happens. A developing mind that is neglected will cause the person to either disassociate or deviate. Now, disassociation means it creates alternate personalities and it'll go to the fantasy realm of the brain. Now, this is a type of what we call one of the six types of schizophrenia, um, which is where the person becomes catatonic. So catanesis begins developing when the brain begins pulling into the fantasy center of the mind escaping the outside world. And so what happens is a person will develop personalities like Batman, Batgirl, Superman, Supergirl, um, Dora the Explorer, you know, the Seven Dwarfs, um, a God, Ra, Isis, you name it. It'll do whatever it takes to pacify and pass time and not go crazy because it needs the stimulation. Now, if it does not disassociate, it will deviate. And when it deviates, it becomes antisocial, but it's coupled with a psycho or a sociopathology. And because that person is building an animosity or a bitterness inside, a pain will develop. And the only thing it can relate to is the pain. And so what it will decide to do is cause other things pain in an attempt to associate and attach because they're unable to attach. Why? Because they've been neglected and deprived and they have their senses have been burned off because when, it, when a brain reaches a point where it cannot attach, it will quit trying. And it will burn it off. And this is a complete detachment disorder where the person detaches from themselves, their emotions, and everything around them. And they can no longer feel. Why? Because the brain does that in order to prevent itself from having to shut down completely and die. Because it wants to live. So deprivation can cause incredible problems in the developing psyche. It can cause uh, schizophrenia. Uh, catanosis, it can, it can cause um, antisocial personality disorders, it can cause psychopathologies and sociopathologies. So it, it, in, in the deviance, it's a terrible thing. How about a hyperstimulation? When they program people, they will do hyperstimulation. Why? Because it makes the brain want to escape. It says, I need a break. I'll do whatever you do, whatever you need in order to escape. And so it will detach. And this is why they will um, 
why they will use a hyperstimulation, a mesmer chart followed by pictures. Sometimes they'll have a spinning machine where they spin them on a bed or spin them on a chair. Or they will use electronic stimulation to various parts of the body. Okay? They do that because the brain becomes hyper pliable, hyper suggestible. And when that happens, it, it creates personalities in order to escape. But it'll let you it'll it'll take on whatever the personality needs to. If it's watching a Snow White film, it'll become Snow White, maybe even all the dwarves. It may become everybody depending on how much stimulation and which part they, they want to develop. Okay, I didn't want to make this uh, too awful long. This is a helping the helpers. But you need to understand the impact that isolation, hyperstimulation, deprivation have upon a developing psyche. Because you're going to be working with people who maybe they're filled with a bitterness. Maybe they have a malignant antisocial personality disorder or a self-defeating personality disorder where they shoot themselves in the foot. Whenever anything good goes to happen, they will do something to cause it to break. Why? Well, that's called a deviation. And it's a deviation that happens as a result of neglect. You understand there has to be a balance. A child has to have edification. It has to know when it's doing good. It has to know when it is better. It has to be encouraged and blessed. You speak curses upon a child. Beat a child down, physically or worse, verbally. You reject it. Don't give it the love that it needs. I think you understand. All right, this is Dr. Tom, and I hope this helps you in your counseling. Remember, Jesus can overcome all of these problems. In Christ's love, till the next one.